but mighty through God of pulling down a strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Dear Heavenly Father, open our understanding today, illuminate us and enlighten us, that we can prepare for the things ahead, <clears throat> what you have for us, that we don't miss the blessings that you have for us, and that we may be able to head off any problems that may rest uh, ahead of us. Lord, today, open our understanding and illuminate us and enlighten us, that we may be able to present this message in an understandable way. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your peace. You're such a great God. And I know you're able to keep us in the days ahead just the way you're keeping us now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, I want to be speaking about preparing today for tomorrow. <clears throat> what's going to determine what's going to happen to you tomorrow depends a whole lot on what's happening to you today. You can change your whole circumstance, you can change your whole situations. What you do with the past determines what you will do with the future. If you can't let loose of the past, you won't be able to face the future. Someone's past marks where they have been, but not where they are going. What you did is not what God is looking for after it has been at Calvary. That's what Calvary is for, is to release you of your past. If, if Calvary didn't release you of your past, then you don't understand Calvary. Calvary is a place of death. Calvary is a place where everything that was done, whether intentional or unintentional, in the wrong way, has to be dealt with. <clears throat> Our future depends largely on what we decide to do with it. <clears throat> and I want to show you something here. We have the, the spirit part of an individual, the spirit. Whether you're right, wrong, good, or evil, we all have a spiritual part. There is a spirit that's governor in your life. Either the spirit of God or the spirit of error is, is, is guiding you. And then we have what we call the carnal. I don't believe this pen's doing a very good job writing. Maybe I can get another. The carnal part of an individual. So with that carnal... Uh, you see, when you, when you are spiritually minded, you are on the positive side. So we're just going to use that. When you're, on, uh, when you're on the spiritual side, you're on the positive side. When you're on the carnal side, you're on the minus side. The carnal mind does not have a solution to anything. The true spiritual mind has a solution to everything. Whatever you choose to become depends on what you are going to be doing with your mind. The mind is either a carnal mind or it is a spiritual mind. Whatever is going on in the spirit controls the mind. Whatever the mind is doing controls the spirit. They work together. So what we, what we do, uh, whatever is in the mind, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So now we have the mouth. Whatever goes on, if you're carnally minded, if you have a carnal nature, your mouth will speak negative things. If you have a spiritual mind, your mouth will speak positive things. 
Everything God does is positive, even if it is a warning. God has a solution to problems. <clears throat> your mouth determines your future. Your mouth only kicks in gear by what's on your mind and in your heart. This is the heart of man here. The heart of man is either filled with carnality or it's filled with spirituality. When you, when you make a decision to speak and you speak out of turn, then what you're doing is exposing carnality. <clears throat> what is going to happen to you in the future, the real you, is whether you're spiritually minded or carnally minded. A carnally minded person centers his or her thinking around themselves. A spiritual minded person centers around others. A spiritually minded person is not interested in hearing dirty jokes. They don't interest him. But the carnal mind is, is pretty much capable of handling that unless you're religion. Uh, spirituality and religion are not necessarily the same thing. You can be ever so religious, and that doesn't mean you are Christian. You may do everything right, and you may be as carnal as you can be. You may be ever so religious and be carnally minded. You may be ever so sure you're right and base everything you do on carnal. You don't know the difference. <clears throat> If I take the Word of God and interpret it with the carnal mind, therefore I become, <clears throat> I will interpret this Word with reasoning because the spiritual things don't make sense to the carnal mind. So I begin to try to interpret the Word of God with my carnal mind <clears throat> And what carnal people do, even in religious circles, they begin to look at all the negative things in the Scriptures. They begin to, to doom you, judge you, criticize you, find fault with you. They have a problem of hearing correctly <clears throat> because they only hear what they want to hear and misunderstand what they don't want to hear. The carnally minded person may be ever so clothed with humility in his own way of thinking, but inside he's carnal. <clears throat> that carnal man is reasoning all the time. He's afraid of the future, although he may not say it, he's afraid of the future. The spiritual minded person does not have to be afraid of the future because the future is in the hands of his God. The carnal mind has the future in his hands. <clears throat> we decide what the future is going to hold. We're afraid because we have the reins. But the future for the spiritual mind does not matter what tomorrow holds because it's in the hands of Almighty God, and you have a connection. The Spirit of man and the Spirit of God are functioning together. The carnal mind is enmity against God, so the Spirit of the living God cannot deal with the carnal mind, and he's afraid of the future. He can't trust God with his future because he has been in control, bringing him on the negative side. The spiritual mind is always positive. The spiritual mind is the one that develops faith. The carnal mind is the one that develops doubt. When the spiritual mind is in full operation, the spirit of the living God is functioning and operating and leading, and faith begins to build up. That's why the Bible says here, casting down imaginations. Every time that spiritual-minded person begins to think, a carnal thought, immediately he has to crucify that. That's why the Bible says the renewing of your mind. Your mind is going wrong. 
The mind is, uh, when the mind begins to think wrong, you act wrong. You cast that thought down. And let's say it like this. Well, will God be able to hold my marriage together? The answer is yes. For the spiritual mind, but the carnal mind says no. I don't think so. The carnal-minded people seldom go to the spiritual-minded person for advice because the spiritual-minded person deals with truth. When the spiritual-minded man deals with truth, the carnal mind shakes away. He'd rather have you say something nice. He wants something easy. He don't want to face the truth. In our future, everything depends on this cycle. If the spiritual mind is in operation, the mind is thinking spiritual things, carnality is moved out of the way, and the mouth begins to speak words of faith. If the carnal is in operation, <clears throat> it controls the mind, the spirit is shoved out of the way, and the mouth speaks the carnal. You can choose which way to go. It's 100% your choice. Uh, you can decide what's going to happen to you in the future. Now, people are worried about the mark of the beast. God doesn't seem to be worried about the mark of the beast. God doesn't seem to be worried about his people coming through the end time when he said they're going to suffer persecution. He doesn't seem to be worried about it at all. So if God's not worried about it, I don't think we ought to be either. If God has things under control, we're safe. When man has things under control, we're in problems. <clears throat> Most carnally minded people want pastors that are carnally minded. Can you guess why? Spiritually minded people feel uncomfortable with a carnal preacher. The carnal mind is the one that's watching his clock all the time and thinking of his chicken being in the oven. He has a problem. He can't handle anything except what the carnal mind can handle. The mouth begins to speak what's going on inside of you. I don't know what's ever going to happen to this generation. I'll tell you everything flying to pieces, everything gone to the dogs. Well, wait a little. Not everything gone to the dogs. Not everything's flying to pieces. <clears throat> I met an individual one time that considers themselves to be a very strong Christian. And I immediately, I began to see carnality really operating in that person. Everything that that individual spoke about in my presence was something bad. We started talking about spiritual things and instantly it's negative. We changed the subject, go to some other Bible verse and it's negative. And finally, I said, <clears throat> did you realize there's some positive things in the Word of God? It isn't all bad. There's some good things in the Word of God. Uh, you know, I began, as the Spirit of the Lord led me, to begin to bring up the other side of the thing. She said, well, I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know that. And I keep speaking, well, I didn't know that. See, she was taught, you know, taught to be negative. Folks, it's just as simple to be positive as it is negative. Let me show you the difference between positive and negative. It's raining. We, most of us are pretty glad it's raining. Uh, I hope there's nobody in this building that's not glad it's raining. But we're glad it's raining. Uh, the negative person may say something like this. Well, it probably won't rain very much. It's been so dry, it probably just rain just enough to just settle dust. 
The positive man says, well, my God is in control. He may just dump us a whole bunch of rain out here yet before this thing's all said and done. See, there is expectation future. For the spiritual-minded person has an expected future. The carnal man is afraid of the future because he's in control. Nobody can operate a home when he's in control because when he's in control, he's out of control. When a natural-minded, the word carnal actually means natural-minded. When a natural-minded carnal person is operating a home, he's going to fail. It's just not going to work. But a spiritual-minded man has a home that's going to work. <clears throat> if you sisters that have men that's not living the way they ought to be living, I'd start asking the Lord to penetrate them with the Spirit. Let his spirit convict them and bring them into a spiritual relationship. It has to be the heart has to be changed. <clears throat> a dog has a dog heart. So what will that dog do with his heart? He'll dig up a bone. He seems to relish dog food. Now, since I don't have a dog heart, I'm not interested. You could not whip my appetite by bringing me the most blessed advertised dog food in America. I'm not interested in the dog food. You could bring me magazines in here and say, now look, you can subscribe to this magazine. In fact, the matter is, we'll give you a free subscription for this magazine. I'm not interested in those negative uh, magazines. It doesn't bother me at all. I'm not interested in them. There's just certain things I'm not interested in. <clears throat> I'm not even interested in the free subscription to some of the spiritual magazines because they may get my spirit messed up. Mm -hmm. But the carnal mind does not have a future. The spiritual mind has a future. Now, let's go over the points for today. Preparing today for tomorrow. Now, this generation seems to have two problems in the men, at least, is that they have a problem with their backs and they have a problem with their hearts. Now, the, uh, there was a certain surgeon said he operated on some present-day men and found that they didn't have a heart and they didn't have a backbone. That's the reason we got problems. It would be good sometimes if your husband gets a little wimpy. Uh, if your wives would just kind of run your finger up and down his back and say, I'm just checking to see if you have a backbone. <laughs> you can't see the heart, but you can feel the backbone. <clears throat> Now, I'm not recommending you do too much of that because you might get your mouth the wrong place. But uh, you think about preparing today for tomorrow. What do you want your tomorrow to be like? What do you want to happen? Let's say that tomorrow you're going to run in the greatest temptation you ever ran into that you ever knew was possible. Today determines what you're going to do with the temptation tomorrow. How you're going to handle conflict. Suppose you run into a testing. Maybe God will test you tomorrow. What are you going to do? Today determines what you're going to do. And folks, the thing of it is, God is not trying to find fault with people. He's not looking for fault. Did you remember when Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest? He wants you to have rest. That's what he's not looking to find a way to condemn you. He said what he's trying to do is get you out of your condemnation. See, Jesus said <clears throat> that he that believeth not is condemned already because he believeth not in the Son of God. There in John chapter 3. He's already condemned. What he's trying to do is get you away from condemnation. What do people do? You know, recently <clears throat> a fella was in uh, our meeting, and he said to me, Oh, we? He said, Brother Rhodes, you better pray for me. I got all kind of bad stuff going on in my life I didn't know anything about. 
Now, you see what he did? The Spirit began to touch some things in his life. What the Lord wanted to do was get rid of it. And the man said, I want to unload this thing. I don't want this anymore. See, that's the, that's the positive approach to the negative situation. That's the solution to the problem. Uh, you see, it seems like failure is a part of the human race. But it doesn't have to be. When you face, let's suppose that the church will go through some persecution. Most of us say, well, let's take it easy. I mean, you know, let's not have too much problem, you know. You know why? Because we're weak. Did you know that China has been praying for years that we get into persecution so we get spiritually minded? Oh, I'm spiritually minded. You get into persecution, you'll find out where your spirit's at. What would you do if you faced a severe temptation? <clears throat> what would you do just the other day? I cast a demon out of a lady that had problems. I didn't know the lady had problems. She come up with just uh, regular needs, and I detected she had more problem than that. This woman testified that that demon left her. Now she said, I don't want to do that anymore. See, she's not struggling trying to do right. She says, I'm free now. I don't even want to do that. That's not even in my book. I don't know. This lady may have been 80 years old. I don't know. I, I can't guess women's ages. But she's free. She said, no, I don't want to do the things I used to do. That's where Paul came from. And he, in Romans chapter 7, he was talking about before he got delivered, he had struggles. But after he got delivered, he didn't have to worry about that. Now, <clears throat> number one is that if you're going to prepare for the future, you're going to have to check your heart to see what your heart is like. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4.23. That heart, what's the heart condition? I'm not talking about the heart beat, I'm talking about the spiritual heart of man. What is it like? Psalms, 100, uh, Psalms 51 and verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. That's what he was crying out for. The future requires that your heart is right with God. Whatever happens tomorrow does not matter. We prepare today for tomorrow. The heart. Now, as I get a chance, it may come back to some of these, uh, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That's Psalms 51 and verse 17. And then in Psalms 34, 18, it says, The Lord is nigh to them that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite or a crushed spirit. See, folks, when, when God hears a person who says, Lord, I have sinned, I've been carnal, I've been negative, I've been wicked. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I said things I shouldn't have said. I thought things I shouldn't have thought. But I'm repenting when God hears that broken heart cry out. You see, the future <clears throat> is going to be victorious for somebody. Are you aware that there's some people going to come through the worst times in history and they're going to come through with a shout of victory and you'll find them robed in white in Revelation. It said, what are these that have come out of, uh, who are these that's robed in white? John answered and said, you know who they are, I don't, you know. And he said, these are they that came out of great tribulation and has washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, folks, the devil will not control your future. You control your future. What you're going to do tomorrow <clears throat> depends on the choices you make today. Number two, <clears throat> the conscience. 
<clears throat> we prepare our conscience to face tomorrow. Our conscience needs to be trained if they're going to face severe temptation. We need to make sure that conscience is going to bother us if we go to do something wrong. See, we often use the conscience like this. We say, well, the conscience hurts you if you do bad, and it feels good if you do good. But the conscience has more work to do than that. The conscience is to tell you, no, I cannot conscientiously do that. Now, Dave's got a lot of money, apparently, and if he would drop a $100 bill here, and I'd just say, well, now, look, <clears throat> you know Dave's got money enough, and he'll never miss this, and after all, I need it. And, and I think the Lord had him to uh, lose that $100 bill out of his pocket so I could get it. <clears throat> but you see, if my, if my spiritual mind is working right, I began to think, no, that's not right. I can't keep that. It's not mine. If God wanted me to hide that $100 bill, he'd have asked <clears throat> Dave to give it to me. And hey, Dave, I'm not asking for it. You understand? You keep your $100 bill. But the thing of it is, I'm saying that we make excuses because the carnal mind begins to reason. Well, maybe God hide that happen so I can get it. <clears throat> but that's not the way it always works. Now, so you train your conscience that that conscience says, no, no, we're not going to do that. The conscience says, no, we're not going to do that because it's been trained correctly. But you see, the Bible speaks about those whose conscience is seared with a hot iron and it says, <clears throat> uh, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared or branded with a hot iron. That's First Timothy 4, 2. And if you think about it, actually your conscience is branded. It's branded. That means now that you are officially capable of doing wrong and feel good about it. It, it's not going to bother you anymore because now the carnal is in control and everything starts getting easy because there's no longer that trigger that sounds. It's no longer the alarm going off. But we can do it. That's hardness of heart. Now, <clears throat> the, the conscience must be trained to be honest. The conscience must be trained to, to be pure. <clears throat> Titus 1.15 says, And to the pure all things are pure, but to defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their minds and conscience is defiled. Their mind is defiled. They just, all they think about is perversion. Do you know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that you can have your mind renewed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, God wants to get your mind changed. Change your mind. <clears throat> he wants your conscience to be so active that all evil looks exceedingly wrong. Let's say the stone slinger. Uh, you see, I have told people, you've heard me say this before, they talk about the stone age being years ago. No, the stone age is now. This is when people are throwing stones. They're criticizing each other. You remember the woman that was brought to Jesus caught in adultery? The religious, the religious, carnal religious fella says, Hey, Jesus. Religion, oh yes, religious as can be. Hey, Jesus. Hey, this woman caught in adultery. According to the law, she's to be stoned. What do you got to say? You know what Jesus said? He that is without sin cast the first stone at her. You want law? Go do it. But you have to be sinless before you throw that stone. <laughs> hey, listen, this generation doesn't know the, 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 uh, the uh, condition. You have to be sinless before you throw stones. Jesus writes on the ground. I don't know what he wrote. But he wrote something. I don't think he's trying to write on the ground to place information there. I think what he was doing is giving these fellows some time to think things over. 
After a while, he gets up and turns around. The woman's standing all by herself out there. And he said, woman, where's your accusers? She said, I don't have any. He said, neither do I confuse. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Quit the sinning business. What he, what he was showing that under the new dispensation, he's not going to kill you, he's change you. He's, he's not interested in killing you, he's interested in changing you. He's not interested in seeing if he can harm you, he's interested in seeing if he can do you good. I bet that woman never committed adultery from that day forward. I bet she never did. I believe she'd have been afraid to because her conscience would have got her then after the Lord gave her such deliverance. And if you want that stone-throwing job, it's in John chapter 8. <clears throat> now, number three is the mouth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable. And I say, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What's going to happen to me tomorrow and how I'm going to prepare tomorrow is what I'm saying today. I'll probably have arthritis because my family all has arthritis. You see, that's preparing yourself to get arthritis. I don't know what that's like because the doctor told me when you're 50 years old, you'll have a heart attack. Or was it 40? 40 years old, you'll have a heart attack because the condition of my body was calling for a heart attack. So I get ready for a heart attack. Boy, I mean, my 40th birthday came, and I said, now I'm going to have a heart attack. Isn't that stupid? You know why? Because it's carnal-minded. If I'd have been spiritual, I'd have said, oh, no, I don't think I'm going to take that. Well, then I didn't have a heart attack. I had a heart failure. Almost died. The doctor said, you're not going to make it this time, I don't think, but I did. I was preparing for trouble in the wrong way. Now, it's good to repair. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with your mouth in the future? What are you going to do with it? Because what you say will depend largely on what's going to happen to you in the future. How you say it. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. What are you going to do with your mouth today depends on what's going to happen to you tomorrow. If you say, well, nothing good ever happens to me, nobody ever give me anything. Recently, a fellow walked up to me and handed me a watch. I didn't know the value of the watch at all. He just handed it to me and said, the Lord said, give you this. Well, I took it. I said, thank you, and you know, so forth. And I said, I don't know if this watch is valuable or what it's got. <clears throat> I don't know what I had. But uh, it's believed to be quite a watch, you see. Until I find out different, I'm going to believe it's good. Good watch, a nice watch. A, you know, well, anyway, how do I know whether it's worth $10 or $1,000? I don't know, but there's one thing I do know, it was a gift to me, and I thank God for it. Do you want good things to happen? You stop talking about all the things that don't happen to you. <clears throat> Boy, I'm telling you, I just don't understand it. I mean, tell you people, make promises to me, they don't keep them. You know what? Do you keep your promises? Might be good to check, because you usually reap what you sow. Now, wait a little here. Anybody catching on with that? Isn't that right? <clears throat> now, eyes. What are you going to do with your eyes? See, if you're going to depend on tomorrow, you've got to know what you're going to do with your eyes today. What's your eyes going to look like? What are you going to look on? <clears throat> you focus your eyes on everybody and say, boy, I, you know, how do you look at people? How do you look at your circumstances? How do you see your boss? You want to clear things tomorrow, get your eyes focused right. The carnal eye sees everything in the negative. The spiritual man sees everything in the positive. It'll be better. It'll be better. It's coming better. I may not have the best job now, but it's getting better. 
words. My tomorrow is going to depend. Let's say it like this. I'm afraid. How many times we use the word, I'm afraid? One day, Esther went to close the window in the house and said, I'm closing. It's dry. We need rain. And she says, I better shut the window when we're gone because I'm afraid it's going to rain. She stopped and she said, I am not afraid it's going to rain. I'm afraid if I leave the window open, it's going to rain in. But that isn't even what I want to say, she said. She corrected herself. See, we say, well, I'm just afraid that those tires on my car isn't going to make it. Tell my next paycheck. Be just like me to have a wreck, too. It'd be just like me to blow a tire out there and run me in the ditch. You prepare for the future by what you say. I mean, you just got all kind of things in your... You see, that totally minded person is full of garbage. You say, well, am I a Christian if I talk like that? I suggest you quit talking like that. Because the future, if you begin to prepare today to get your eyes to see things the way God sees them, God sees things different than we see them. Do you think God sees in the future and saying, now, wait a little, I don't know about this thing. I didn't realize we'd go run into all that problem. God doesn't worry about the future, so why should you? Keep your eyes focused on the one who promised to get you through. He said, I will never leave you, and I'll never forsake you, never. And folks, today you've got to get your eyes focused on Jesus. Get it off of your problems. Get your eyes. Uh, you know, the psalmist said, I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes. He's, and you see, if I'm going to prepare to tomorrow, I'm not going to be sitting here looking at some kind of uh, stuff that is going to corrupt my mind. Psalms 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I like the word cleave there. This stuff is not going to cleave to me. I'm not going to watch that stuff on television. It's going to cleave to me. Now, you're going to watch it. I'm not going to pervert my mind. I'm not going to see the wrong thing. You bring a pornography magazine in there and say, hey, this is a good one. It isn't good to me. I'm not one bit interested in it. I have no desire to see that trash I got to keep my mind pure. I got to keep my mind right. I'm not going to look at junk like that. You see, your eyes must of necessity be kept from evil. If you're going to face the future, tomorrow you may face something you never expected to face. Let's suppose the mark of the beast does come up. Your eyes have been trained on what to do. All right, now let's say it like this. All right, somebody criticizes somebody else. And you see that person. You're going to start judging him if you don't see him the way that the Lord says. Do you remember the man that had a, uh, Jesus said, Hey, why considerest thou the moat that's in thy brother's eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye? Well, the, the fellow could see the moat in his brother's eye, but he couldn't see he had a great big beam in his own eye. See, Jesus used these things to illustrate what's going on. He said one time, he said, you strain it a knot and swallow a camel. You, you're trying to strain a knot out of your stuff and swallow a camel at the same time. Well, you see, what you see is going to make you either fearful or acceptable in the future. All right, you see into the future that there's going to be trouble. What are you going to do about it? You prepare today to see God get you right through that circumstance. You see him bring you through the worst trials in the world. I mean, you see him bring you through earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, you see him delivering you 
and the Word of God begins to rise up in you, and the Word comes out of your mouth. I don't see a problem. I see God. I see Jesus. When Stephen was being stoned, he looked up and said, I see Jesus. See, in Matthew 7, you have that account there about the, the mote in the brother's eye, but considers not the beam in thine own eye. And Jesus said to the disciples, he said in Matthew 13, 16, but blessed are your eyes, for they see. Your eyes see. Your eyes are seeing the right thing. You've got your eyes trained. Now you look at the fields, and you'll see the fields are white already to harvest. I don't see anything. I don't see anything. That's the reason a lot of people never get in their ministry, because they never see anything. You, you got to get your eyes focused on the things that you want. Get a vision of what you want tomorrow. What do you want your atmosphere to be tomorrow? You get a vision of it today, and tomorrow it will become that thing. Start thinking the positive way. Ah, my marriage has fallen to pieces. Can you get a picture of it turning around? God is able to turn it around. You know, folks, I don't preach something I don't live. No use me trying to do that. My marriage works. Esther and I have a right to challenge each other if anything goes wrong. We have a, we have a, a right to do that. We have a right to make sure that our marriage works. We defend that thing. We see our marriage working. We have a vision of a great marriage. We have a vision of being overjoyed with each other. That's your vision. What's your vision? What do you see? I've got a vision of getting people saved like in abundance more than we ever got them saved before. Tomorrow is another day, and if it isn't, you take care of what you can today. Remember, God is the author and the finisher of our faith. Number five, our ears. What we hear is going to determine largely what's going to happen to us tomorrow. Jesus said, blessed are your ears, and then he says, for they hear. Matthew 13, 16, blessed are your ears. Do you have blessed ears? Are your ears blessed? Do you have blessed ears that God could speak something in your ears and he knows you're going to hear him? You train your ears today. You, you get your ears ready, just like your eyes and your mind and everything else. You get your ears ready to hear right. Your conscience and all is operating in this area and now all of a sudden, here you are. You're going to decide this whole program, what you're going to do with it. You hear. Once you have your ears trained, you would not listen to anything that would be destructive. What about turning on the news and hearing about how bad everything is? I'm not against news, but there comes a day when you may have to cut some of that off. In Acts chapter 2, 37, we have some people that heard the gospel and they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Romans, I mean, Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Go a little further, and you'll find in chapter 7 another group of people that heard the preaching of the gospel, and look what they said in verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. One group of people. What's the difference? Right here is the difference. One received the spiritual end of it. The other was carnal. The moment that message came in a negative form, one received it, the other rejected it. 
The carnal mind wants to get retaliation out. So the carnal mind says, let's retaliate. They started biting. Paul warned us not to bite and devour one another. You might be consumed to try that. You see, what our ears hear, what do we do with it? How do we judge when our ears hear things? What you hear today is going to depend on what you're going to do tomorrow. You're going to have to get your ears trained to hear the right thing, your eyes to see the right thing, your mind to think the right thing, your conscience to operate correctly, and that will take care of the future. The future is not what you need to worry about. The future is, if you're going to worry about anything, worry about worry. If you're going to worry about anything, worry about being carly minded. Got to get away from that stuff. Get your thumb out of your mouth and start shouting victory instead of sucking your thumb and crying help. We may cry help to God, but one thing for sure, we're getting ready to get out of this mess. I expect the future to be a blessed future. I'm expecting that. Number six, <clears throat> what are you going to do with these hands? When you run into temptation, what are you going to do with your hands? What are you going to do with your hands when you, when you, the Lord says, I want you to go out and feed the hungry? Let me ask you a question. The Bible says lifting up holy hands. Could you lift your hands at any time? Are they holy enough you could lift your hands and make a request to God? See your hands. <clears throat> Paul said, my hands have ministered not only to my needs, but to the others as well. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 34. You see, let me, let me show you a picture here. Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 10 and verse 15 and 16. Verily I say to you, whosoever shall receive the kingdom of God as this little child, he shall... Uh, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as this little child shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. Now I want to ask questions. Those of you which have children, can you pick your little children up and can you bless them? Are your hands clean enough to bless them? Could you transfer blessing? I have to make sure my hands are clean because I lay hands on a lot of people. I have to make sure these hands are clean. That these hands are capable of ministering to the needs of people. The future, some of you are called into a ministry. Are you preparing today for your hands to be ready? Are you training your eyes to see the needs of the people? Are you training your ears to hear what people need? Is your conscience capable of helping you when you want to sleep instead of pray? When you want to eat instead of fast? Can you, can you face tomorrow with certainty that he who carries tomorrow is certain to bring you through? He to begin a good work and you can perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's going to do it. He who started faith in you will keep you going. But the hands, wherefore, lift up hands that hang down in feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest uh, that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Hebrews chapter 12. We need to help each other. We need to love each other. We need to minister to each other. Folks, what you're doing when you're preparing for the future is ministering to the needs of those around about you. Loving them, helping them, ministering to them. <clears throat> it may be times of sharp rebuke, but then you don't rebuke forever. You go give my, I, I don't give a child a whipping and then go around and whip him for 17 years. There comes a time you quit whipping. That child has to have a hug and understand that even in the midst of this discipline, I still love you. I remember when they used to emphasize that, the reason they give you whipping uh, because they love you. And somebody told me one time, said, my daddy must really love me. You see, that's carried too far. There comes a time 
I remember a daddy one time was getting ready to spank his son for something, and I'm telling you, he, he pulled that son aside and said, Look, son, I don't want to spank you, but I'm going to have to. I told you not to do that. You understand? And the Bible says, Spare not the rod and spoil your child, and I'm not going to have you spoiled. And I'm going to give you a whip, and I'm going to give you a good one so you can remember it. And he did. <clears throat> You know what? You know what that son said after that spanking? Thank you, Dad. Sure. I don't think this generation of people who take care of that kind of thing ever heard that kind of thing before because they haven't had very many people that will go to their son and get him a spanking like that. I've had people right in this church, I don't know if they're here this morning, but they, they've been here, come up to me and say, Brother Rhodes, I just want to thank you personally for correcting us, for going on and speaking out what the Lord has to say. Somebody just told me just recently in another state, Brother Rhodes, I'm glad you got the stuff it takes to just go on and say what you mean to say, and we don't have to guess what you're saying. I don't know the person, never met him in my life. You know what? We're preparing for the future today. We're preparing right now for the future. What are you doing with your hands? Now let's go to feet. This is the seventh one. I, I want you to notice what Luke chapter 1 and verse 79 says when uh, Zechariah was prophesying uh, here's what he said about his son. His son. He said to give to light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the ways of peace. You know what? This boy was going to be the forerunner of Christ and get everything lined up. His feet... Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When you get ready to go out, your, your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Folks, the future is before us, not a dark, gloomy future, but one with the almighty God in charge. Walk on. Walk on. There may be a sea in front of us. The children of Israel came out of Egypt, and now they face the Red Sea. There's no place to go. When those eyes were focused on the Lord, everything was okay. When their eyes were focused on their problems, they began to murmur and complain, and they got everybody else defiled. They got to hear on what somebody else got to say. You could have a root of bitterness sprinkle in this place in a hurry. If somebody would say, you know what? Brother Rhodes has been making mistakes recently when he's preaching. He keeps goofing up. I think something's wrong with him. I've been noticing too. And boy, the first thing you know, you're carried off. And you don't know where you're going. And everybody's hurt and everybody's paralyzed and everybody's pain. But you see, folks, what we need to do now is to get our feet ready to carry the glorious gospel to the end of the world. It says, blessed are the feet, the beautiful feet of those that carry the gospel. Would you like to have those beautiful feet? Romans chapter 10, 15, and how shall they preach except to be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of priests that bring glad tidings of good things. Beloved, I'm going to tell you something. God is not against you. He's for you. I'm going to tell you something. You folks may think I'm kind of rough sometimes, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm for you more than you think you. I'm more for you. I'll tell you what. You meet me some night in your dreams about 2 o'clock in the morning and see whether I care about you. I'm telling you the other day, I mean to tell you, I went through some struggles the other day. I mean, I got down into business with God. I'm, 
I'm pressured to get your marriage right. I'm pressured in the nights to get everything in your life straight now so you get all the blessings of God poured out on you. I'm not against you. I'm for you. I'm not here with a hammer to hit you over the head. I'm here to, to uh, get you changed. God is not here to get you down. He's here to lift you. I'm going to tell you what, folks. God wants you more because you're missing blessings. You're going to miss the future. You're going to miss the good things God's got for you out there. You're going to miss a lot of that. I mean, I'm blessed, man. I'm telling you, I'm blessed. The other day, I went into an airport, and I was amazed at the courtesy that people gave to me. I mean, I thought to myself, what in the world is going on? I mean, just courtesy. You see, the favor of God is on you. That's what? Get ready for the favor to come upon you. They'll walk up and give you a watch and say, the Lord said, give it to you. They'll walk up and give you a gold coin and say, the Lord said, give this to you. Somebody walks up and say, the Lord told me to pay this and pay that. I'm not looking for those kind of things, but God is my provider, and God got a right to give me whatever he wants to through anybody. I'm not out here with my hands outstretched and say, help me, will you? See, there's not clean hands when I'm here. Showing. Brother and sisters, is it any way you all could help me, please? You know, I need a new suit. No, I don't need no more suits for right now. <laughs> I've been blessed with suits. Go out to Indiana, and I was thinking, I wish I'd have taken one more suit along. Because, you know, of everything. Guess what? Before the day was over, I had a new suit, a new shirt, and a new tie. You, you want that to happen to you? Prepare for it. I'm expecting good things to happen to me. The Lord said, open your mouth wide, and I'll fill it. Fill it with what? Good things. You betcha it's good things. You can expect good things. You know, I don't know how to handle some of that. I get so blessed sometimes, I don't know what to say. These young people come up to you at places. I said young people. I'm talking about teenagers or below. Come up to you and say, I want to give this to your ministry. Boy, I'm going to tell you, that brings almost tears in my eyes. A young fella came up one time and he said, Look, I got a little money here I'd like to give to your ministry. It was $200. What could he have done with $200? Young fella came up to me the other day. I don't even think he's in the teens. I don't believe he is. He said, Brother Rose, I want to give this to the ministry. $40. You want to say, no, you better keep that. No, you don't. You use that for seed. Pray God that he'll bless them. That's what you do. <clears throat> Little boy came to me one time, and I knew he didn't have any money. He brought his piggy bank to me and said, I asked my daddy if I could give everything I got to you. And I started to say, well, maybe you better keep... And the Lord stopped me and said, don't you stop that boy. I'm teaching him how to be a giver. That boy dumped that piggy bank stuff out. And I don't know it was... It wasn't a whole lot of money, but I mean every penny counted. <clears throat> Folks, listen, those touch my heart. You and I are heading for a future... That future is not going to be a dark future. It's going to be a bright future. Why? Because Almighty God's in charge of my future. When I was in charge of it, I failed up. Any, anybody in here ever witnessed to that? When you was in charge of your life, you messed up. When God's in charge of your life, you make it, right? And I see my time's up. <laughs> glory, <laughs> glory to God. <laughs> 
Well, well, well. Today, listen, if you don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow, two minutes? That's not what my time says. Well, anyway, those of you which don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow, you want a good future. Maybe you say, well, I'm not sure I'm even saved. If I just cuss a little more, it would help. None of that did anything to me except drag me down and make me dirty and filthy. But one day I met Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that taken away the sin of the world, and you could have all at the back of the world. God, I don't want us bit of it. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm, I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in dirty jokes. I'm not interested in cuss words. <clears throat> I'm not interested. I'm interested in you being blessed. I want you to be blessed. I want you to face the future with certainty. No fear. No fear, just faith. Step right out there. I've got my ears trained, got my eyes trained. <clears throat> I've got everything trained. Conscience is trained. My mind, <clears throat> you're not thinking that, remember? We got a new mind. <clears throat> hey, you know it's easy to cut bad thoughts off as it is thinking. Start thinking of something else. Whatsoever things are, 